with the Council on Thompson on his election victory last Thursday and to commiserate with the, the candidates, uh, Councillor Young, Councillor Baxter, as well as the other candidates. It was a, it was a fairly fought and hard-fought campaign. Uh, it, was, it was quite an experience. So, so we'll move on to Brothers, the other... Sorry, can I just join you in congratulating um, Councillor Thompson and wishing him well and hoping that he'll represent, uh, I'm, as I'm sure he will, the fully Midlodian win, uh, in Westminster. And I'd also like to, to join with you in congratulating all the candidates and parties for, for, for a good uh, um, election that was well maintained, well balanced uh, 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 and friendly at the most of the times. Well, uh, Deputy Provost, uh, I'd just like to uh, <coughs> congratulate the two main candidates on their speeches at the end of it. I thought this struck just the right to note uh, after a good fought campaign. Thank you. And would it be appropriate also to thank the di different groups who put on the hustings, which I thought were very well run and very effective? Thank you. Any other comments on that? No? No? <laughs> okay, so... Order. Order of business. Is as printed in the agenda. Any declarations of interest? Chair, I would like to declare an interest on the notices of motion 6A. And yeah. I'll be leaving the room. I will have to as well. So. Senator Adelaide. So we move on to the minutes of the meetings uh, for, which have been circulated for approval. So the minutes of the meetings of Midlothian Council dated the 24th of March 2015. Can we have a proposal and a seconder, please? And for noting consideration, for noting in consideration of any recommendations uh, therein the, of the Cabinet of the 3rd of March 2015. Can I have a proposal and a seconder? Just informed I don't need that. And for the planning committee on the 3rd of March 2015? Provis, if I could make a comment on the minutes, please. Um, it's, it's to do with the creation of this new loan fund. I've, I've just realised that there's not, there's not actually any amount uh, designated in the minutes about how much we're going to put into this fund. And I just wonder if we've missed it or if somebody could tell me where it will be. What page is that, Councillor Bryant? What page is that on the minutes? Sorry, it's uh, 239. And this, um, sorry to, for the slight delay, but we've, we've just approved the council a minute. We can come back to Councillor Bryant with um, any detail that follows on from that in due course. Thank you. So, General Purposes Committee, 24th of February 2015. The Local Review Body, 10th of March 2015. The Audit Committee, 17th of March 2015. And the Petitions Committee, 4th of November 2014. And item number five, questions to the Leader of the Council. None have been received. Uh, thanks very uh, much, uh, Deputy Provost, and um, really just to say the, the motion, I think, is, is, is self-explanatory, but by, <coughs> excuse me, by way of background, I mean, uh, 
Goodness gracious, it goes back a long, long time ago when I, I first encountered the, 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 um, the Lothian Mine Workers uh, Centre at uh, Wharton Lodge in, uh, in, in actual fact in uh, Gullen. And uh, it was at a time uh, during, during, during the, the miners' strike, in actual fact, Chairman, when, um, uh, sorry, Deputy Provost, when the... Um, when uh, on Edinburgh Council, there was a number of families, as like there were a number of families in, in Midlothian and uh, indeed in, in East Lothian in particular, um, were affected and they needed uh, an area to go and have a bit of uh, respite. And uh, I got shown around the premises uh, at that time and um, saw the hard work that went on by an awful lot of volunteers. We always think that people do things and it's always about the the pounds and pence in their pockets. A lot of volunteer work went on there. And I went back some 20 years later, and uh, it was amazing how that building has not only stood the test of time, but has been modernised uh, in a way that uh, fits in with the environment that it's around it. And um, I think we were all a little bit shocked when we found that this had somehow fallen between the cracks uh, when the the grant uh, scheme was, was reviewed. And in actual fact, the Miners, uh, Mine Workers Convalescent Home Trust actually has a, a service level agreement with its local authority and therefore didn't fall into the category of uh, having to apply for a grant uh, to be considered in, in the first place. But I also have to say, uh, Deputy Provost, that they have had very, very good and constructive meetings uh, with the officers of this council, the leader of the council, uh, and others. And uh, there has been an understanding between the Convalescent Trust and, uh, and, and the office here that uh, something has to be done. There's a recognition of the work that actually... Sorry, Provost. Deputy Provost, must be... No, oh, it's sitting back off the, the speaker there. Um, <clears throat> it, there's a recognition of the work and hard work that goes on uh, down there. And, I mean, we've now introduced, for example, the, uh, the council have the, the wee breaks fund, which uh, the officers from Midlothian Council were actually down at uh, Gullen Home, uh, sitting there, uh, speaking to the residents that were coming in there for respite care and talking to them about opportunities and possibilities. I think they do a magnificent job. And, uh, and, and I'm sure we all recognise to do that, that, that job. But the interesting thing is that it's all about, <laughs> here we go again, it's all about core funding. And when that core funding disappears, then, you know, to be, enable the, the trust to, to continue at the level it does uh, and, and can do, then puts a whole lot of pressure on a lot of people. And as I say, Deputy Provost, it's not about money going in to people's pockets because an awful lot of the people down there actually do the volunteering. It's actually about having core funding to get on and do the job that they do down there. I would just hope that the council would recognise the job that uh, the Gullen Home does and would uh, move to uh, reinstate the, the monies that they have enjoyed from this council over many years. Yeah, I agree to it fully. I mean, this, this is a, a valuable asset for us to have access to. Um, and with our uh, criteria for the years of the, the, the former mine workers and their relatives uh, benefiting from the, the respite, I, I, we hate to see that door being closed to, to that option. I mean, it's not just the council uh, for the core funding, but it's many voluntary organisations within Midlothian that are now referring people you know, for respite care. And the appropriate... The, the age of uh, a lot of the, the widows, a lot of the minors uh, are getting to now, you know, that anybody who has been to that and had the respite care really do feel that they've had a quality break. And uh, uh, I'd like to see us restoring the, the, the service level uh, agreement for the funding for its the core purposes to allow it to, you know, uh, uh, develop as well. Thanks. Councillor Constable. <coughs> Thank you, Deputy Provost. Uh, <coughs> In light of the, yes, this uh, Lothian Mine Workers Convalescent Home does very good work, and it seems to have fallen between uh, two stools here. They understand the service level agreement came to an end in 2013, and there's been some uh, thing. So I'm happy to see them get their grant 
for this year, subject to a report to next month's council from our officials. So, Councillor Johnson. <clears throat> There's, um, I asked, when I saw this motion, I asked for some extra additional information, and I couldn't make out from the correspondence coming back and forward exactly what the position was. And I read that the service level agreement ended, and uh, they were now uh, getting money from another source, e.g. the grants. And then some letters explaining it somewhat differently. So I'm at a loss to understand exactly what was happening. And I, I agree with Bob Constable, we should have um, a report. But essentially, I do agree with the motion. Thank you. So the motion is approved. Okay. With, the, with the report to come back to Council next month. Thank you. Back in, DJ. The provost there too, I think he's coming in as well. Be noted that Councillor Wallace had an interest in the, the last motion also for, for the record, please. Thank you. So it's item 6B, which is a, a motion congratulating Pennicut High School and winning the Scottish Schools Football Association. I'll, I'll, I'll go across to Councillor Montgomery. Thanks. Uh, aye, the, it was a great achievement for the team. The, you can see for the motion, it's quite self explanatory, and I'm not going to go on forever about it. Uh, the main reason for putting the motion in was to try and get some form of civic recognition for the team. Um, a lot of them have actually left school now because it was fifth and sixth years it was actually playing. Um, I was through at the final at Airdrie and it was a great night. It went to penalties, um, which was quite nerve wracking for, well, it was bad enough sitting in the stand watching them. It must have been horrendous for the, the youngsters that were actually on the pitch, but uh, they rose to the occasion and, and played really well. Um, so, in terms of the civic recognition, uh, <laughs> leave it really, really to the civic head to decide what they want to do. I mean, I don't know, maybe even just as a suggestion for the sports awards, maybe make a special award for the team on the night because it was a Scottish Cup though and it wasn't just a, you know, a local trophy or a local league. But leave that to yourselves rather than maybe bring them all in because I'm quite sure they've been nominated for the team of the year anyway, having won the Scottish because I think they'll be the only team in Midlothian that's done that. Um, so I mean, I'll leave it at that just now, other than just to say that if we'd wait another two years, it'd be the same length of time that Hibs have now won it, John. So. Um, I think they really had to get the really had to get their act together and try and do something and get it sorted out. Um, but the other first team from the Lodi to win it, um, I think there's only some in like five or six teams for the East have actually won it over that uh, period of time. So it's quite an achievement, and the, the lads have done really well. So I'll leave it at that now. Councillor Rosie. Yeah, certainly uh, happy to second this one. Um, I uh, I was unfortunately I couldn't go on it because I was at the, the community council that night. Um, it would have been great to go and see a team winning a trophy that I supported yeah, yeah. <laughs> before anybody else says it. Um, no, um, certainly I know on the night there, fortunately Janet, Janet B from the advertiser was there and she was on her phone all day and then made the announcement that they'd actually won it. So, and it's there. so that was great. So happy to second it and yeah, I quite agree. I think it would be nice to maybe have, if we could have the civic reception for them and also you know look at the sports awards I'm sure there'll be a nomination there but uh, happy to sign that. You know. Councillor Bryant. Yeah at the risk of uh, st stating the obvious uh, Deputy Provost and Provost would you make sure that the, the, the boys who have left school do get invited as well? Uh, just on that I mean they're actually quite a tight bunch I'm quite sure they will um, but just for a bit of information I managed to get the the Hearts team bus on for them to take them through, um, and that was on the basis that it usually comes back with a cup. So, because it was, uh, <laughs> uh, so anyway, so uh, it was a great night all around. But I'll leave it to yourselves to, to sort of some a civic reception, whatever you decide to do for them. 
So I'm not so sure you're a bit second in it now. <laughs> <laughs> never mind. <laughs> I'm not so sure about second in it now, but never mind. Too late. So we'll, we'll look into a civic reception for the, for the boys for that historic one. So we'll move on to item number 6C, which is a, a motion by the, the Lothian Council Labour Group. And I'll pass on to uh, Councillor Milligan. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, the motion itself speaks to, to, to itself. Um, last month, um, the members of the Shadow Board um, attended a, a seminar or a meeting up at New Battle uh, um, Health Centre, where we stood and listened to doctor after doctor sort of pointing out the obvious to us that there was a problem with getting GPs and there's a problem managing to fulfil the role and dealing with members of the public. In fact, one of the GP uh, uh, um, health centres had actually closed its list. Uh, um, and I understand they might be in a position now to, to, to reopen it, but uh, that's no so I'm sure. But what we did listen to was the, the three GPs effectively telling us that there was a major crisis within the service and one of the areas that, that was really concerning to them was is that there was quite simply more GPs going out than what there was coming back in. Uh, um, there were other issues that were given about people going into general practitioners and deciding to cut back in their hours and no commit to full time working uh, um, after so many years. One of the GPs actually gave us a working week explanation, which, when you, you, you seen it, was working from 7 o'clock in the morning to, to 10 o'clock at night, uh, um, five, days a, five days a week, and then having to cover out hours uh, and different stuff like that at the, the, the weekends. You can clearly, and we were certainly clearly told by um, the doctors in attendance there, that this was already a crisis that was just looking to get get worse. One of the things I think that shocked us all was to learn that not all available training places in Scotland were being taken up. Now, I understand for the figures I've got that the, 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 the Lothian ones in generally have been taken up, but this is a Scotland-wide problem and doctors didn't train and decide that they'll just stay in the, the area that they, they trained in. The figures I have is, for example, for the 2014 Year 3 programme, there was 118 places offered and 111 accepted. And the Year 4 programme, 183 offered and 134 accepted. A total of 301, which was 56 places that haven't been filled or remaining to be, to be filled. And the Year 215, uh, um, and keeping in mind that there are some, still some adverts and hopeful that some of the places will be filled, it gets slightly worse, where 133 places being offered for Year uh, um, three and only 123 being accepted and for year four 172 places being offered and only 98 being accepted 74 remaining so the whole 305 there were still 84 places unfilled uh, as we, we, we speak today I think that tells its own story that becoming a general practitioner is not something that seems to be an attractive um, option an attractive job for people going into uh, um, the medical world, and it's something we need to look at very quickly to try and re redress the balance. There was also some discussion, and I've had some discussion with GPs about, you know, well, why are there so many rushing to go, and there seems to be some changes to, to, to pension rules and tax rules and stuff like that. And, and in the motion, we're asking the Scottish Government to look to see if there's a way that they can uh, um, offset some of the losses in that to try and encourage some of the existing GPs to, to stay in longer to see if there's a ways we can do that. There's also some problems with, with, with GPs retiring and staying on the roll with them being, being able to be registered uh, and some difficulties there where some of them might indeed be willing to take on some coverage uh, um, after they've retired uh, um, and it's trying to ask the Scottish Government to look at ways to see if these GPs need to continue to be have that kind of level of training and stuff, but keep in mind these are doctors who have served a very long period of time and, uh, and very well qualified and we would like to ask that they, that they, that they look uh, um, to sort of see if we can get some of the GPs who have recently retired to, to, to come back, even if it be on a part time basis to try and offset the problem. I think every one of us have been 
in contact with some of our constituents, and indeed in some many, and some of the Facebook sites you clearly see regularly many constituents complaining that they can't get to see a GP, they can't get to uh, any medical treatment uh, um, at all that day, and sometimes having to wait days, sometimes weeks, to see somebody who can, can, can help them. I think we've got to commend the, the, the work of a lot of the staff and indeed the, the, the health board and that and looking at ways of trying to offset that. I think we talked about signposting and that was making sure that people that didn't need to see a GP were sent to the people who were best qualified to, to, to help them. And I think that kind of work is invaluable and has stopped this becoming a complete catastrophe. But the reality is, is it's only edging it off. And if we keep going along the ways where we're going, we're ending up with a, with, a, with a bigger population, less general practitioners, doctors, then the situation is going to get worse. So we'd actually ask that we ask the Scottish Government and uh, indeed the Health Board to look seriously at that. In the last area, um, I'm aware that there, there has been some serious concerns raised about the, the, the Lux service, effectively the out-of-ever service to us that talk um, English. Uh, um, uh, we rely on the out-of-ever service in Midlothian, which is situated in the community hospital, um, as a fallback uh, uh, and a, a, a relief for having to travel all the way to the Royal Infirmary, and especially people with children. It's somewhere near hand, it's somewhere with direct bus service for Pennycook Lone Head. Uh, um, that, that, that there are buses reasonably direct there. So we seriously have concerns that the review that has been taking place, although I understand it has greatly changed for where its first proposals were, uh, um, but we have some real serious concerns that to cut this at this time, and I, and I know that there's been some fancy words put on that it's not a cut, it's not about saving money, um, and it's not about improving the service. Well, if it's not about saving money and it's not about improving the service, why are we touching it at all? I mean, I mean, it's a simple question, and it's not a question that's simply asked with me. That's what uh, uh, um, Dr Andrew um, Neve, who's the clinical lead uh, um, for the out of hours GPs in Midlothian and GP cover for Rulands, that was a simple question he asked. Um, we're talking about taking away one of the cars during the week. Quite clearly, there are calls uh, uh, um, on that car. If there weren't, we wouldn't have had it in the first place. And the reality is, as by not having that car, we're going to disadvantage some of the worst off because it's people who can't travel to the hospital uh, um, in Midlothian, so therefore they're not likely to be able to travel to the hospital uh, at the Royal Infirmary. So, so therefore we would call on the service not to be touched. And I think uh, if we look at some of the comments, there's concern about bringing nurses away from bases. Um, and there is the suggestion that, uh, and I think quite a sensible suggestion, that we ask the boards to consider uh, um, additional funding instead of cutting this service. This is something that, 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 that's going to be needed more and more. Um, this, quite simply, um, if we continue to cut this and we take this off, uh, um, the out of our service uh, um, is something that's basically needed because folk cannot, at this moment in time, at times, get an appointment to see a medical professional to deal with their illness. And quite often they're told, if your symptoms get worse, phone the out of hours. We've got a growing population, uh, uh, sorry, uh, an elderly population which is growing, and we all acknowledge that there's going to be a lot more um, care within the, the houses and that. So therefore, this is a service that's going to take on a lot more meaning and be a lot more uh, um, needed. And to cut it at this time, I think we should be taking um, Dr Andrew Neves' um, comments that he made regarding this. We haven't, where he says is having one car will put more pressure on ambulances and triage. There's concern about bringing nurses away from bases and ask, could it not be possible with more funding being directed to care in the community, there could be more funding for GP as our service to improve the service rather than reduce it. Now, this is the guy that we've taped to run in this service. So all we're asking here is, is that we go, and, and this isn't a decision for this council as I see it, as to whether or not they do or not. It's, I think we need to be recommending very strongly to, to, to the people that are reviewing this um, that they, they take cognizance of the problems that are there, the problems with the GP services just now, and the whole any further cuts to this service. Councillor Muirhead. 
Yes, Deputy Provost. Uh, I'd like to second this, uh, this motion uh, to the Council today. Um, I've got to say I'm, I'm somebody over the years that's been fortunate enough not to have much uh, to do with the, with the doctor's surgery. However, in the last couple of years I have had. And I'll tell you, um, the amount of effort that goes in to trying to alleviate problems like this and the surgery that I attend at New Buyers uh, is absolutely tremendous. However, they are definitely struggling and it is even worse now when they can't uh, recruit uh, uh, GPs. Um, we, we're, in a, we're in an area where there are demographic issues, there are legacy health issues around, around the, the, the pets, and, you, you, and the, the health that the effect on people's health that that kind of work had. Um, and I all credit to not just the doctors, but the staff, the nursing staff, etc., these, the, these, these medical practices that do their best to try to, to, to cope with, with, with the number of people that are seeking appointments. I have, over a period of time, had anecdotal uh, complaints for other people about, uh, about uh, not being able to get appointments. But as I say, it's getting increasingly worse. And in areas like ours, and it applies to a number of other areas across Midlothian, as things are starting to pick up in terms of coming out of the, uh, 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 the, uh, the downturn, and you can see all around Midlothian, and particularly in the, in the, in the Gore Ridge area, where the house building's moving on at a pace now, that's only going to put even more pressure uh, on, the, uh, on the, the local medical practices. And while we're, we have plans to extend the lights in, in, in new buyers, that only works if you've actually got the doctors to put in the, the medical practices. So I, I would absolutely um, urge support uh, of this motion because we need to do something to break that, that uh, the position that we're in and get more GPs uh, available uh, to work in our communities. Councillor Johnston. Thank you very much. In essence, we agree with the, this motion, but we want to uh, write down um, in paragraph two, uh, we would like to change that to say, Council does acknowledge that the BMA, the NHS Scotland, NHS Lothian, the South, thank you, <laughs> the South Deanery and the Scottish Government are already working in partnership to encourage recruitment into GP training and recruitment for this year is still ongoing and we've had that confirmed by Alistair Short. Um, paragraph 3, I, I agree on, with Derek saying that we should do more to encourage doctors to stay um, in GP practice for longer um, and, uh, and help them to do so. But in paragraph 4, we, we, we um, have notification from Alistair Short that the, we can't halt the review because it's already finished and the consultations have come to an end. And after the consultations, uh, it was decided because the representations by doctors and nurses and members of the public in various different community organisations that um, they couldn't go ahead with the proposals they had recommended and, and they have now changed them to, um, to say that there's to be no reduction in opening hours in East or Midlothian and one car is to cover East Midlothian, East and Midlothian on weekday evenings but will be supplemented by the car from the Royal Infirmary if required and, that will and there will continue to be two cars at the weekend. The nurse staff centralised at the three main bases with an outreach service to East and Midlothian and there will be one GP and nurse based at East and Midlothian bases. Um, these changes uh, to the initial review recommendations are said to be positive outcomes for Midlothian and have already been welcomed by the clinical director and head of health for Midlothian CHP. But I must point out as well that the governance and accountability for um, the services uh, with East Lothian Council and they have already accepted these recommendations on the, um, the 30th of April this year. And I can, yeah, Bob's got the amendment to pass round.
Councillor Constable. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, in supporting Cath's amendment, uh, I would just want to say that I was at that meeting at uh, New Battle as well, and it is a desperate situation we have of recruitment of GPs. <coughs> One of the points mentioned was that in the medical schools, the way that adults develop when they're young like that, the girls seem to <coughs> have an advantage, and more girls are getting onto these the medical courses to become GPs. And in the nature of the uh, events, they tend to go part-time when they're getting into their 40s or so later on uh, with their families. And this, of course, is adding to all the pressures. It is a totally nationwide problem, and a solution is, of course, uh, very difficult to find. Uh, as Kath said, the, uh, the review is finished, and I think the paragraph 4 particularly sums it up rather well. So we have a... Did the Labour group accept the amendment? Yeah, um, I would like some clarity uh, on the statement that East Lothian governs uh, um, this programme and have already accepted that. Could somebody for the officer corps, who are very much aware that there's a non-political motion down here, trying to find a service for our, our population public, having the bother to share this information with the Labour group? Um, but if somebody could maybe inform us and myself and Councillor Pottinger as Shadow Board members as to what um, East Lothian Council have the authority on. I actually thought it was the Health Board that actually done this, but could somebody please inform us? Just to inform, it was East Lothian Community Health Partnership that agreed it. The Lux Services hosted as an East Lothian, so it was the Health Partnership that agreed it rather than the Council. So it was the um, CHP for East Lothian. It was their subcommittee that had agreed the, re um, the Lux review. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm quite disappointed. I, I'm, I'm quite annoyed that the, the fact is that there's a, a, a motion here that's non-political. As I say, it's about providing uh, and trying to make sure that there's an adequate service of GPs here and, and somewhere or other it seems to be getting turned into a, a political uh, um, football and we seem to have the administration of this council answering questions for the Scottish Government uh, um, and uh, um, the, the, the shadow board or the, 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 the health board for, for East Lothian Council. It's also disappointing that we'll, we've actually put this motion here and, and the, the administration, um, while I spoke to Kath this morning, she says that there were some changes, and certainly on para four, she talked through them, but never indicated there would be any amendment put down, and it would have been great to have the, 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 the amendment. As I say, this isn't a political uh, where as it stands. At, at the moment, we would probably accept most of what's in, in, in that once we have full, full, full knowledge in it. And yes, I, I hope where they're talking about deleting para two, um, the Council uh, um, acknowledges the BMA, NHS Scotland, NHS Lothian and the South East Deanery and the Scottish Government are working in partnership. Certainly at the meeting we were at, that's not what we were told. There was absolutely no mention of what action was being taken to address this problem. Now, if I'm wrong, there was two senior officers who were there that can correct me. I can't mind anybody saying what was, what was happening to, 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 to address this. Councillor Johnston. Hi, in my role as the representative on the NHS Lothian, this issue is discussed very regularly and we've had a presentation from a lot of GPs Lothian wide on the NHS and that's where I have found that information out from. So um, that was via a, a, um, a director in the health board called Alan Boiter from the, who works with the South Deanery and the HR department in the health board. Councillor Constable. Uh, I just wanted to assure Councillor Milligan, we know we are trying to be political about this, and uh, Catherine and I agree with uh, paragraph two. We're quite happy for paragraph two to stay in. Yeah, I, I, I mean, Chair, I, 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 I mean, the motion, we're just going to move it. Uh, uh, it's been moved and seconded. We think it's a reasonably competent motion. If these are the answers we get back, then these are the answers we get, get, get back. But I think we should make the Council's position really clear make sure that, that we're on record as having raised your concerns about this and we're on record as stating that, that we think that the current out of our service should be either left alone or improved. 
and we're going to just keep running more motion because we didn't see anything. As I say, if these are some of the answers we come back, some of them are reassuring and, and, and to be welcomed. And, and if these are accurate, that's fine. At the moment, we've had them put down in front of us. We're not sure where all the information comes from, uh, um, uh, and therefore we're just going to stick to our original motion and, and ask that Council endorse it. OK, so we've got a, a motion proposed by Councillor Milligan and seconded by Councillor Muirhead. And we also have an amendment proposed by Councillor Johnston and seconded by Councillor Constable. Can all those in favour of the motion please show their hands, please? I've just been notified. I should have asked for the amendment first, so please accept my apologies. Would all those in favour of the amendment please show their hands, please? Can I just ask for a bit of clarification here? Is that, <coughs> I apologise for uh, not being here earlier. I was at a hospital appointment. You can hear my voice. So I'm not sure now who would uh, take the casting vote, whether it's the, the chair or myself, as I promised. In terms of standing order 1124, it is the chair that has the casting vote in all matters other than matters of election to, to bodies and posts. OK, we'll move on to item number seven. So I, I voted in favour of the amendment, just to be clear upon that. I think, Chair, sorry, just to clarify, in terms of your, it is defined as a second or casting vote. So the fact you voted in favour of, of the amendment the first time doesn't equal your second vote automatically, being that you'll have to officially cast your second vote. Well, I cast my, my second vote in favour of the amendment. Okay. <clears throat> so we'll move on to item number seven, which is a Midlothian Integration Joint Board appointment of voting members and initial chairperson. It's a report by John Blair, Director of Resources. Thanks, Deputy Provost. This report invites Council to nominate four councils to serve on the Midlothian Integration Joint Board. The background is set out in the main body of the report, and Council are reminded that the integration scheme was approved at the previous meeting of the Council in March 2015. Today, Council is invited to consider the recommendations as listed on pages 14 and 15 of today's papers, and in particular, items A, B and C. Thanks, Deputy Provost. Councillor Johnston. <clears throat> I just wondered if we've got an update um, position, uh, on the current position regarding the integration scheme in the Scottish Government, um, and are we still in the 28-day period after week eight? And if so, are we on target to meet the end of June deadline? Yeah, we are still on target. We've had some initial feedback from the Scottish Government on the integration scheme, and they are looking for a few minor amendments. Those have been the same amendments that they're looking across on a lobby and wide basis to the scheme, as other elements that obviously it's the NHS lobby and elements of what's going into that. But at this point in time, yes, we are still on target. Councillor Constable. Uh, thank you. Uh, this whole arrangement of the Integrated Joint Board is an initiative has been running for some time, as you mentioned. Uh, we have, it was set up, uh, initially we set up the Shadow Board in my position as leader and to put on the four uh, elected members onto it, uh, we required. I agreed to for a political balance on it and we had two from each side. This subsequently came uh, and a legal requirement. Um, Alex Neil made it a requirement, so I'm glad to know, I wanted to note that I made it politically balanced before we had to. Uh, just as a small matter of point. Uh, the whole, going through to the recommendations, uh, to nominate the four councillors, I nominate, of course, our t the two that are on, that is myself and Councillor Johnson, onto it, and I'll pass it over to uh, 
the other side to Councillor Milligan uh, for his two. For our proxy ones in Part D, uh, that will be uh, <coughs> Councillor Wallace and uh, Councillor Coventry. Uh, and for in Part uh, C, to nominate the initial chairperson of the Integration Joint Board, excuse me, uh, I can nominate Councillor Johnson. I take it it's in order to move everybody like that. Um, is that yeah. the right way to do it? Yep. Well, I'd, I'd like to move um, for the, the two serving members, uh, Councillor Milligan and Pottinger, for the, four, the two um, named uh, Councillor Proxies, Councillors Young and Russell, and for the initial chairperson of the Midlothian Integration Joint Board, Councillor Milligan. Can I have a second there for Councillor Muirheads? Okay, so so what we'll do is we'll have a vote on item C on the recommendations which is the chair of the committee so would all those in favour of Kath Johnston as a chair please show their hands All those in favour of Councillor Milliken? Um, <clears throat> um, Provost, this, um, because there's an equality of votes and there's no casting vote um, in this case because it's about the um, appointment of a member to a post. Um, there needs to be um, a drawing of lots under um, 11, paragraph 11.6, brackets 2 of the standing orders. Um, what I would suggest, Deputy Provost, is that we just take a few minutes out to clarify uh, with both parties the price, precise mechanism we'll use um, for doing that and, and uh, reconvene in a couple of minutes if that's um, okay, for the, from the council's point of view. Has everyone agreed? Yeah. Well, so we're going to have a cup of tea and allow the we'll report back here in five minutes. Can we, the meeting? Can we not? Can we not just do it at the end of the meeting? Do the rest of the business and then do, then that do it at the end of the meeting. Part the chief executive suggesting at the end of the meeting. Right. Okay. Well. I'm, has everyone agreed to that then? We'll just we'll continue to the end of the meeting and then draw the lots. Provost, do you realise that I have to leave earlier? It shouldn't make any difference, Councillor Devink. The vote has been taken on that item. Okay, so... So apart from item C, the report is agreed, and we'll, we'll come back to that the, the, towards the end of the meeting. <clears throat> so we're moving on now to item number eight, which is a single Midlothian plan for 2015-16. It's a report by Kenneth Laurie, Chief Executive. <clears throat> Thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, this report seeks members' approval of the Single Midlothian Plan for 2015-16. A summary of the plan is attached to the report, uh, and a copy of the full Single Midlothian Plan has been circulated um, to councillors. Um, the background to the Single Midlothian Plan um, will be, I think, familiar to, to members. The report sets out the development process, 
for the plan, the key local priorities, which are unchanged from the last two years, um, the approaches adopted in terms of prevention, capacity building, and co-production and access to services, and the three priority communities in terms of area targeting. Um, and the recommendation uh, in front of members today is that Council approves and endorses the single middle of the plan. Councillor Constable. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, a lot of progress has been made in this plan on, along, on our priorities. We have to congratulate the, uh, ourselves on that. Um, but Lothian is seen as a good example of good practice in community planning, and I just want to move the recommendation. Councillor Baxter. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Before we do, I'd like to ask a question. I've not had a great deal of time as myself and many of my colleagues here are quite busy over the last week or so. So I looked at one particular area that I do have a certain interest in, and that's the uh, carbon reduction. If I refer the Council to the actually detailed report rather than the summary, so I appreciate that that's, that's probably not in front of us here, but on page, I think it's about page 52, it refers to the greenhouse gas emissions for which Midlothian is responsible. And the target, the outcome target by 2020 is 4.5 tonnes in the, in the per capita. Now, have, I had a look at this, and this, this um, is met uh, by two uh, priorities. The first one, reduce, reuse, and recycle our waste. The second, and this will be this is my first question, is to keep the area clean and tidy. Now, my, my question in that respect is, how on earth does that uh, contribute towards reducing carbon emissions? Uh, the second one, though, I'd like to, uh, to, to focus on this reduce, reuse and recycle our waste because um, according to uh, the uh, DECC data, it suggests that our uh, per capita emissions in Midlothian are 5.8 at the moment. So we're talking about a 22.4% reduction over the next five years. Now, without going to the detail of the figures, if you look at the Carbon Management Plan Progress Report for 2014, which was, uh, which was signed off by Cabinet on the 18th of November of last year, the total amount of uh, landfill is uh, equivalent to 7,536 uh, kilograms. Effectively, if we stopped all our landfill, recycled all that waste, the only difference it, from the figures I've got, the only difference it would make is about, it would reduce our carbon emissions by about 1.6%, well, well below that which is the target in the detailed papers here. And as there are no other ways of achieving that, uh, my question is, uh, how do these figures stack up? John Blair. In the council chamber, I don't do guessing. What I prefer to do, Councillor Baxter, is come back with a detailed report on the points you refer to in the paper, because there's quite a lot of information there, and I prefer to give a written answer following consultation with my various colleagues across the whole council. Councillor Baxter. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Well, this is before I came on to the implications of Cold Hall, which although the uh, implications of burning the coal are not part of the scope here, the implications of getting it out of the ground certainly are, and that would also have a significant negative impact. Uh, I, I'm very concerned at, um, at approving uh, the, this item on the basis of something which the only thing I've looked at in detail, because it's something which I knew I could get at the information quite readily, because I already understand it to a certain extent, there's a lot in here, the single Midlothian plan, that I've not had a chance to look at. And if I can't have confidence in the one bit where I can ask questions, then I can't have confidence in the whole paper. I would suggest to Council, therefore, that we maybe have a seminar, that we maybe have some of these questions answered, because colleagues here, as I say, we, we've all been quite busy. We've not had the time to scrutinise this in perhaps the depth which we would like to have done. Uh, can I propose that we have a seminar before we bring this back to Council again and vote on it? 
Councillor Milligan. Yeah, thanks, Deputy Provost. Um, like Councillor Baxter, uh, um, the Labour Group um, have had time to, to give a, a quick read, and I've, I've got to stress that probably is a quick read. It's a reasonably large document, and that, and we believe a seminar would help. Like Councillor Baxter, we had some concerns that, uh, um, that, that were raised through the group, especially on um, areas such as the targets that were being set and how realistic were they that we were actually going to achieve the targets? Were we setting too high a, a, a target in some areas where we were undoubtedly going to fail? And I know the Chief Executive will always argue you set the highest target possible and try and try and hit it, and it's probably the right way. I would ask I, I, that we, we could easily agree here, and certainly we're going to agree that a seminar would be helpful to go through not just that part of the paper, but the, the rest of the parts of the paper. We didn't think there's anything on to milk unsurmountable they are and indeed we probably with explanation we'll get an agreement at the end of it but we believe a seminar would help everybody get a better understanding and perhaps a, 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 a what the, the, the whole plan is and, and, and better for the, the, the future years to make sure that we all are aware of what we're signing up to so we would second the motion of asking for it to be continued to a seminar. Councillor Bryant. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I've also had a quick look at the, at the plan, and I didn't look at the, the climate change one. But it might give Councillor Baxter a bit of comfort that we're going to have a zero waste plant here in Middle Lothian, which will take care of quite a bit of the climate change. Councillor Constable. After all this, no problems with that. We'll have a seminar. <laughs> Is Council happy then to approve and endorse with a seminar possibly in the future? Yeah. Okay. So item number nine, it's uh, service plans 2015-16, report by Kenneth Laurie, Chief Executive. <clears throat> Thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, I suppose I'd start off by saying that the decision we've made on the previous report in terms of the single Midlothian plan clearly has an impact on um, the service plans because the framework um, in terms of how the service plans relate to the single Midlothian plan is set out um, in this report and what the report is doing of course is seeking approval um, for the service plans which have been um, circulated to members. Uh, I, so uh, I suppose what I would say is that on the basis of the previous um, decision uh, in effect the, the final approval of the service plans necessarily depends on the final approval of the single Midlothian plan. But I'd also ask members to, um, to recognise that because officers are needing to get on with delivering um, you know, their work plans for the year, that in effect we are running with the draft service plans until they are finally uh, approved. And they represent a continuation of what members approved last year. Councillor Constable. Yes, I have just approved the recommendation then. And I understand and the position that uh, Kenneth has taken on that. Councillor, happy to approve? Yep. Mm -hmm. So, item number 10, which is a local scru scrutiny plan 2015-16, report by Kenneth Laurie. Um, thank you, uh, Deputy Provost. This report's, report, as you say, presents a local scrutiny plan for 20. Um, 15, 16. This is produced by the local area network <coughs> of local audit and inspection um, representatives and in fact it replaces the, um, the former assurance and improvement plan which you've seen in previous years um, and the scrutiny plan is attached um, as an appendix to the report in front of you um, today. Um, <coughs> the report includes a number of um, very positive aspects um, turning to page 44 in the agenda where the, um, the details of the scrutiny plan um, start. Um, at paragraph 4, the local area network have identified sound progress against the indicators for the three priorities of economic growth, positive destinations and early years. At paragraph um, 8, uh, they've identified no scrutiny risks in relation to the education service, um, describing the, the services benefiting from strong, strong leadership and direction. At paragraph 9, no scrutiny risks in relation to social work services and the council and his partners have made good progress in recent years. And at paragraph 10, the local area network considers that overall the council's housing and homelessness services 
perform well. So a number of positives there. Um, the report, on the other hand, also highlights the challenges of delivering the Council's transformation um, programme and improving performance reporting. And these are both issues the external auditors will monitor progress on during 2015-16. And in terms of other scrutiny, the areas of focus this year will be public protection, aspects of the housing service, including the position in relation to new bars crescent. Uh, members are asked to note the local scrutiny plan for 2015-16. Council, Council. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's very positive, as especially the big progress on positive direction, uh, positive outcome for our young people. Uh, in general, a very positive welcome report to read, and I would move the recommendation. Councillor Point, sir. Yeah, just a wee bit to uh, highlight 5.8 ensuring the qualities. Uh, is, is obviously in all these reports, but it doesn't seem to have any sort of uh, direction uh, to ensure qualities in, in, in this report. 5.4 has got the key priorities, which are all, uh, I'd call, core uh, policies, and, and core also overlaps with, with the, the equalities issues. And, f for instance, and, and if this, this plan, plan is, to, uh, like other plans, are to be effective, it's got to be measurable. You know, we've got to have a target where we're going to go to, you know, so we can scrutinise it and, and, and find out. If, if there's a service, for like, for instance, delivering a library service, you know, this, this, this plan would have to include in the service plan the, the, the protected characteristics uh, of uh, individuals who are actually using our library um, and what they, are their views on the library service, um, the same as other uh, people in other uh, 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 usages. And the, the, this kind of analysation figures have to be presented to, to the council uh, regularly to, to effectively ensure equalities. So I'd, I'd, I'd like to see it just a bit more meat to the bones on this. We're actually having measurable targets and having uh, uh, more effective uh, uh, service plans which would include the equalities outcomes. Can I just say on the, the, the positive destinations for young people, I think the record in Midlothian is second to none. We've gone from below 85% moving into a positive destination for school leavers up to nearly 94%. We're now, we've gone from 30th out of 31, or 30, 31st out of 32 local authorities to 7th. So, you know, I think there's something there to be commended for Midlothian Council. You know? Council Point. There wasn't, wasn't a criticism. You know, I just, I'd like to see more measurable and uh, uh, facts and figures. And if we've got good facts and figures and they're measurable, let's get them out there as well. Um, just in relation to um, Councillor Pottinger's point, I mean, the, the, the question of equalities is, of course, an exceptionally uh, important one. The issue here is that this report is produced externally to the Council. So this is a report that's been produced by the inspection bodies and, and presented to us. So it, the, the content of the report is not a matter um, which is in our control. It's a review from the local area network of uh, their review of the, the, the quality of our services and the risks associated with it. Councillor Constable. I don't know, I just heard the word library service coming up there. And I've boasted at Cosla and I've boasted again here. Our library service was the best in the UK last year. So well, another boast that's very good. I'm sure there wasn't any criticism implied. So, is Council happy to note the recommendations on page 42? So, item number 11, which is the fifth review of local government electoral arrangements by the Local Government Boundary Commission for Scotland, a report by Kenneth Laurie, Chief Executive. Um, thank you, um, Deputy um, Provost. Um, the Council last considered this issue on the 24th of June last year um, when it noted that the Boundary Commission intended to um, recommend to Scottish Ministers that the number of wards and number of elected members in Midlothian would remain unchanged. Um, this now takes us on to the next stage um, of the review, um, which is the Boundary Commission's um, developed proposals for wards and invites, uh, invites responses to that um, from the Council, and these responses need to be in by the 19th of May. Um, the Boundary Commission proposals are um, set out in the um, appendix, and members will note 
that the only change proposed is to change the boundaries between um, Bonnerick Ward 2 and Midlothian East um, Ward 5 uh, in the area right by Gladstone's Gate. And this is something which we've sought to have changed for, um, uh, for some time. Um, and the enlarged maps at the back of the council chamber, um, for members that are unfamiliar with um, these wards and want to see the, 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 the detail, is, is there to, to look at. And I apologise for the fact that really the, the maps in the agenda itself are of very little um, use, being very difficult to, uh, to, 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 to review. So the, the impact is that wards 1, Pennycook, ward 3, Dalkeith, ward 4, Midlothian West, and ward 6, Midlothian South, um, remain unchanged. There's just that one minor change affecting these two wards, and the Council is invited to comment on these proposals. Councillor Baxter. Thank you, Deputy Provost. I perhaps should have declared an interest here because it, it, my question involves uh, my ward, and I don't know if there's anybody here who can answer it, but on page 59 of the agenda, it gives the forecast electorate, which seems to be coming down in the Bonnerig ward, which is, I, I don't know, maybe the demographic reason for this but we're continuing to build houses families moving in now we're it's already forecast to be 11 percent variation from parity now if these figures are wrong and my gut feeling is that they are then that variation from parity is only going to go up Councillor Constable uh, yes, something I've discussed with uh, the Boundary Commission people at Cosler conferences. Uh, we do feel in that our population is growing very much, and we do feel that, uh, well, especially in the Bonnerig Ward, we've got Hopefield added. Th uh, three councillors may not be enough. Uh, the recommendations in this, of course, don't make allowance for that. The Scottish Government position is that they only wanted to increase the number of councillors in disadvantaged areas, so uh, that seems to be uh, one thing we might have to look, one thing we might wish to make a comment on. The change to Bonnerig, of course, was long overdue. Gladstone's Gate was still even in Midlothian East. Uh, overall, as a small council, uh, with having only 18 councillors, we are quite hard pushed. We've still got to cover all the committees and things that a large council have, uh, with a lot less bodies. And yes. <laughs> As you hear on my left here, it's hard work. Uh, so that would be my comment on that. Councillor Milligan and then Councillor Young. Yeah, I, I'm, firstly, I, I'm, I'm glad to see at long last Gladstone's Gate um, coming back in where it should be uh, um, into the Bonnerig Ward. It's something that was missed, I think, by, by, by everybody. And it's one of the things that we've maybe echo, and I'm sure the Chief Executive will be quite happy, and that will be for every member when they're going away, is to have a look at their wards, but have a look at it in conjunction with the local development plan and look at what development is going to come along, because quite often you find that the line running around your bounded ward ends up running along the end of the, the last two she's built, and then you suddenly find, as we did, that Gladstone's Gate, which had not been put into Bonnerig, suddenly got built and found itself on the wrong side of the line and therefore in by S Bank, Mayfield and, uh, 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 and Path Head, which made absolutely no sense whatsoever. So, so the reality is I would, I would strongly suggest that every member once, and, and the Chief Executive alluded to it, the, the, the maps at the back of this are, are, are absolutely no good whatsoever to me. I, I, I'm, I'm as blind as a bat. Um, I'll struggle just looking at the big guns. Uh, um, but I would, I, I would strongly suggest there that, uh, that, that, that members have a look at that. Really happy at Gladstone's Gate and that problem is going to be solved. I um, really didn't agree with Bob at all um, on we need more councillors in Bonnerig. In fact, I'll tell you what, I bet if you ask the public in Bonnerig, they would get rid of the lot of us at some stage, uh, some stage to, 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 tomorrow. And certainly at a time where we're cutting other services, the last thing I think we want to be doing is asking for mere politicians. I think the public would vote. Uh, um, Overwhelmingly, if you thought the election result was bad for Labour, that would be an awful burst if we actually suggested uh, um, mere politicians. But we would like to welcome this report uh, and, and ask that, that, that each of the members scrutinise, uh, um, as the member, as officers should, future developments and make sure that they are all going to be in the right place at the end of this. Councillor Young. Thanks. Uh, it's just about uh, Gladstone's Gate. Um, you know, as much as I'll. Look forward to serving those current constituents uh, up until the boundary change. I think it's pretty clear from feedback from that area that you know they're, they're part of the Bonnery community. Uh, so it's just in relation to uh, point four, with the recommendations, just to ensure that um, that when council does uh, comment back to the, the boundary commission, 
that that kind of strong strong view is is made that uh, you know Gladstone's Gate should be part of of the Bonrig ward as it is part of the Bonrig community. Councillor Baxter. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I should have said earlier on that I, I welcome that too, and it's something that the three of us have been working on the the, the issue of the broadband. And Gladstone Gate is one of those areas affected, and the feedback from the residents there is that they can't understand why they're not part of the, the Bonnery community, and I think they would welcome the change as well. Um, thank you, um, uh, Deputy Provost. Um, just a couple of um, comments in relation to um, Councillor Constable's comments in, re in relation to the um, the number of councillors per ward, that of course was the subject of the previous report um, that, that, that came forward to council in June last year. So that issue is, um, is closed. In terms of the review of councillors' workload, that is something which um, the Local Government Boundary Commission has committed to look at, but it will not affect this review. It may um, affect a future review. Um, in terms of any other comments that members may have upon looking at the maps in um, more detail. The, um, the maps are up at the back of the chamber in relation to the two um, wards, Bonnerig and Midlothian East, where there are changes, but the other maps can, of course, easily be made available at that scale to any member that would wish um, uh, to see them. Um, in relation to um, uh, Councillor Baxter's comments about the um, demographics in um, Bonnerig and, and the, the forecast electorate for 2019, I can't answer that. I don't know if my colleague Ian Johnson is in position to, to comment, but if not, then we'll, we'll come back to you um, um, on that. And, and finally, Provost, I'm uh, taking it on the basis of the positive endorsement of the change proposed, that unless any other member comes back to me on looking at the maps in more detail, that um, the, the, the Council is endorsing the, um, the, re the, the proposals as set out. Councillor Rosie. Yeah, it's just so I, I take it if, if we endorse this, we can still come forward with slight changes and amendments to the to what's being proposed here. It, it's just that my reason it is, I mean, and fine, fair enough when you've got the boundary goes up a main you know, main housing area like Morriswood Road or something like that, we've got either side, but we do have a, a, a wee community at Lonestone, which is daft because one side's in Temple Area and the other, and the, yeah, and the other side's in Pennycook. And I mean, they can see Pennycook for the house, uh, and uh, we've got a sort of grumpy constituent there that I'd be happy to get. <laughs> but, but I mean, but if you moved it into the field sort of slightly, it, you know, it may actually we wouldn't actually because my proposal would probably keep them in hours actually. But you know, it's just something like that. If we come forward, is that a still possible? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the deadline for um, a response on behalf of the Council is the, um, the 19th, so that's in, in a week's time. I'd, I'd just be conscious if, um, you know, ideas were coming forward from ward members, it'd be good if they were coming forward collectively, if there was a collective um, um, view, and if there were any minor amendments, then if the Council is, is happy to agree this as part of the recommendation, if ward members came forward with a collective Amendment, I'm sure that could be reflected in the Council's response. Councillor Constable. Uh, yes, happy to uh, endorse what uh, <coughs> Councillor Rossi said and endorse the report. I was just having a moment, and I knew the Council numbers were set, they have been set, but I was just having a moment. Anyone else want to comment before we move on? Okay, so, right. Point, Jeff. Yeah, just, just from, from this side of the, the south side of the, of the, uh, the constituency, you, you can have one stone if you want it. <laughs> we move on to item number 12. This is a, a quality outcomes and mainstreaming progress reports 2013 to 15, and it's a report by Kenneth Laurie, Chief Executive. Um, thank you, um, Deputy. Um, Provost, the Equality Act 2010 was introduced with the aim of making um, a fairer society. It was a consolidating act designed to strengthen the rights of the individual against harassment, victimisation and discrimination at work, at home and in the wider community. 
uh, and it was also intended to advance the quality of opportunity and foster good relations between those who share protected characteristics and those um, who do not. And for the purposes of the Act, protected characteristics are age, disability, gender reassignment, marriage and civil partnership, pregnancy and maternity, race, religion or belief, sex and sexual orientation. Um, the Act requires that all listed bodies, of which the Council is one, publish an initial equalities outcome and mainstreaming report by the 30th of April 2013, and we did that, and progress reports on both equality outcomes and mainstreaming equality by the 30th of April 2015. And that was published on the, the um, 30th of April um, by the Council on both the intranet and the internet. Council are asked to note um, uh, the reports in front of you today, and I apologise for the volume of the, the paperwork, but it is, I think, important that members are aware of the steps we are taking as a Council to promote equalities. And I think overall my comment would be that we have made um, some good progress in a number of areas, and there's clearly more uh, that we want to do. My colleague Leslie Crozier is in the chamber with us today and can deal with any points of detail that members may wish to raise. Can I just say that I found this to be an excellent report demonstrating Midlothian Council's commitment to equality and fairness. I'll just cover some of the... I read through the report, and it's quite extensive, but, so I'll just, I won't cover it all, but securing resources, for example, £450,000 of external funding has been secured to mitigate the impact of welfare reform. £200,000 secured to the armed, by, through the Armed Forces Covenant. This is the largest single award in the Lothians for the multi-sports multi pitch at Beeslack Community High School. There's a commitment to reducing child poverty through the Fairer Scotland Fund. The report also makes clear Midlothian Council's commitment to good partnership working and cites as an example the cooperation between the Council and Morrison's supermarket in Dalkeith during the recruitment, recruitment process for the, for the new superstore. Another example of excellent partnership working is the strong links between the Council and local colleges and universities, an example being the South East Scotland Sector Academies, which have seen many senior pupils take advantage of college courses which can lead direct, directly to year two of a degree at the Q, uh, Queen Margaret University or straight to employment within recognised growth areas in the Scottish labour market, for example, engineering, hospitality, travel and tourism, health and social care, and, and creative arts. There has also been a significant improvement in positive destinations throughout Midlothian, which currently stand at 93.9%, an increase from 85.4% uh, around five or six years ago. We have got to remember, however, that lots of the school weavers are moving in, uh, into employment. They're not moving, the, the, the numbers going into higher education are, are lower than the national average. But so we have still got some way to go but the, the, the trend is in, a, in the right direction. And I also want to mention the report the, the also mentions the excellent work carried out by Volunteer Midlothian, as well as the work carried out by activity workers here in Midlothian, helping to, to get young people who are disengaged from education back engaged and back into a positive destination. Mr Pottinger. In, in, in the equalities... There will always, there'll always be overlaps with the service provision. And things, things we're doing anyway you will know, always continue to be done. And, and they can be reported in that service or they can be reported in equalities because of the overlap nature. I, I welcome this, this report. It is 99 pages long. And like yourself, Chair, I've, I've, I've read through it. But any, any report that comes to this Council has to be tangible. It has to be measurable and it has to have a focused uh, outcomes to the plan. Not just what we're doing and overlapping and what we're, we're doing to meet the, 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 uh, the criteria. And it shouldn't just be a compliance document. It should be an effective plan you know, to take us forward for the, for the next two-year period. Some councils will review their equality uh, outcome and mainstream and progress reports annually. We, we, we're doing it uh, biannually. We've always been starved of resources and the qualities in, in, in Midlothian since I've come into uh, 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 my uh, 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 position of elected, uh, uh, elected members champion for equalities. And I can just see how the, the lack of resources uh, is, uh, is causing uh, some difficulties when we're doing it. 
Now, when we put a, a report of this length, 99 pages, on front of your table for, for noting, I don't think it should just be for noting. I think we should have a lot more uh, on, on this. And I'd like to, and a lot of it was restricted in time constraints, and, uh, and it did go on the internet just in time for the 30th of April deadline by internet. There's also many considerations that have to be given to this report and things we can look at. I've, uh, I've, got, I've got quite a few issues in, in this report, uh, in the progress report, and, uh, and I want, the first one I want to know is, how is it going to be approved by the Council if it's just for noting? And when, when will it be approved? And uh, I hope uh, the Chief can maybe uh, answer me uh, on, on those, those uh, points uh, in, in the report. I've had discussions with the qualities officers on it, uh, and I can see how uh, we, we can uh, beef this report up even a bit, you know, get more uh, information into it. And if you've got statistical anal analysation of it, you've got to have the benchmarking to look at what it was two years ago and then have a target for the next two years. So this is, this is the, the, the protected characteristics and, and the numbers that, that are employed in the council. There's maybe a lot of monitoring the council staff when they come into position and they'll fill out their, 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 their equalities forms. But the, I don't think anybody's really focused on looking at the other side. The current staff, you know, and the trends, who's leaving the council uh, and who's, who's not getting jobs in the council when they're applying for them. Uh, and uh, I'd, I'd suspect maybe some members of the East European communities are, are not uh, prolific uh, within uh, uh, council employment. But we can, we, can look at, we can look at these issues in a lot more detail. Qualities is always, it seems to be a bit of compliance, you know, as if it's some kind of threat. We have to comply, we have to get the support, we have to get this done in time, we have to do the EQIA on it. And, but when many reports are left to a single officer, and when that officer is not available, the reports, I can think, would be deemed as being not fully resourced or possibly rushed. And that's not fair on officers who have to do these reports. Uh, to the council because they have a big priority in the council. We need, we've talked for a while about the need to establish an engaging team within the council. You know, it's a senior level, a third tier officer type level uh, for, for, the, for the, the mainstream and policies within this council. Now, we also have to look at real, real live quality of service for, for protected groups. Uh, these things have had discussion for a while, but I'd like to know now about you know, implementation date and if the administration is going to take that, those issues forward and actually fully implement that, uh, that serious report to it. The benchmarking and the trends and the figures and the percentages are not relevant unless we've got the full payroll. And we have to have the date of that full payroll because uh, it can only ever be a snapshot in time. And then we, we move on to monitoring. But also... Uh, this full report, 99 pages, it says we are meeting compliance. I would put that, that's not enough to be meeting compliance. Um, we, we, have to, we have to have the current stats, um, uh, not always, always who works for the council and or the protected uh, um, uh, characteristics. We have to look at development work as well and what we plan to do for development work to actually make a, a, a difference. Um, and we want to see us getting a margin above compliance. You know, and that, that a measurable kind of margin that, that, that we can uh, report on. For that, we need more gathering and analysis of evidence and the qualities and the mainstreaming. And, it's, and it's, I mean, it's a core policy. It's not just an add-on to, to any council. And LREC's uh, story uh, recently, the imposed funding cuts to LREC, Edinburgh Lothian's uh, Racial Equality Council. By Edinburgh <laughs> Council, we don't fund the LREC. But by Edinburgh Council, are uh, mentioned in the report, but the report makes no mention of how they, they actively supported equalities work in Midlorian. This, this organisation has supported uh, uh, many events in Midlorian, and they, they have development officers, and they, they worked with me extensively on the Black History Month, that uh, event that we had in the Arts Centre, and, and Joe Wallace was there for the uh, introductions and opening uh, of, of the event. You missed a good curry later on, by the way, Joe. The, the administration has a, has a lack of consideration, I think, to equalities. I don't know if any member of the, the administration has actually read the EQIA on the, on the uh, administration's budget. No? Right, but this, this was done 
uh, and it was signed off by uh, Jess Macbeth, uh, who's, who's one of your officers who's no longer with the Council. Now, Je Jess has put mit mitigation into this uh, of uh, further training required. But, I mean, this wasn't even an officer's report. Uh, this, was, this, was a, this was an administration budget. You know, and it talks about the, about the, the, the equalities impact that, that your budget's having on, on the protected characteristics. And I don't want us to go down the line uh, leaving us open to challenge on uh, breaching uh, uh, equalities and uh, uh, moving forward for discrimination. So this, this has to have a, a larger uh, um, emphasis within this council. And when, you, when you're changing services or withdrawing a services or changing a policy, it, it has an impact. You know, but we have to look more at who it has an impact on. Uh, and, uh, and when... If you're denying the right of newly disabled persons to qualify for a taxi license, you know, that, to me, that's a ludicrous situation, and it, it surely it is a breach of equalities. Because, you know, if, for fairness, if anybody becomes disabled, you can't get the scheme because there's a budget cut to it, but somebody else has got it, you know? Uh, and you, but you're, you're new to it, so you're not getting it. That's not fair. Uh, I can mention the community alarm tax. Uh, as well and, and, and many other th things that I think that's not been uh, properly addressed in the, the qualities agendas. And finally, on the issue of the Phoenix Club, when they wrote to every member of this administration, they said that their Thursday evening transport was, was being withdrawn with no consultation, no warning, no notice period. Eh? Now, the, the Phoenix Club for the uh, adult uh, disabled uh, persons of met since 1967, 48 years in a row, they never even got the decency of phone call to say that their, their, their service was being uh, withdrawn. They've never asked for a grant. They've never received a grant from the council. They've only ever, for 48 years, received in-kind support uh, of that bus service on a, on, a, on, a, on a Thursday evening. The club's been run for volunteers, and you know, it's, uh, and the, when they, that happened, they just lost all hope in uh, running it anymore because you know they got no no a, a say or even a part of consultation or even asked if they had funds to, to, to separately funds to, to actually pay for transport the whole the whole thing was just done uh, uh, and there was a big mix-up in communication with Maloney council i know that but you know, somebody should have been able to pick up on that impact that was going to have on that service uh, with the transportation uh, cut so i'm just really looking for the administration to give me some serious and effective consideration to quality issues <coughs> and pay particular care to the impacts of their bu budget decisions they're having. And I'd like to hear that assurance is, is today. And when are we going to have a, a, an equality service plan? This kind of plan uh, could actually be an annual debate, you know, that we could put into issues into it so we could actually have it. And uh, again, that's, that's, uh, that's no any stranger. There's so many overlapping issues and equalities that it's maybe worth uh, going ahead with that kind of seminar uh, scenario. And, and no, just leave all this, this planning uh, report to, to, to one officer every two years. Councillor Constable. Uh, just to say, uh, this is quality. So many of these outcomes, whether they are actually equality issues, uh, to my mind, is debatable. Uh, as you are a quality officer, perhaps you may want to draw up a report in thinking where you, in where uh, you feel that Midlothian policy it's been unequal to various people. We think we are, we I would never dream of being uh, creating inequality issues. It has always been that the council has been very good in that. Uh, decisions are decisions. Uh, whether you've been unequal because it happens to fall on one particular group, as another point of group, you make a decision on one group, they say that's unequal, you go to another group, it might be a binary group, we say that's unequal, and so on and so forth. Uh, you can go a, a long way in this. Uh, whether these are actually equality issues, to my mind, is debatable. Uh, but if you, as a quality officer, if you would care to draw for a report uh, to submit to the council on that, then we can consider that. Councillor yeah, thank you, um, Deputy Provost. Um, I mean, I, I think that it's um, helpful for Councillor Pottinger as the uh, qualities um, uh, champion to input to this. I, I, I'm not going to answer all the um, specific points you've raised, but I want to make a few um, general points. And it, <clears throat> really, to, to the, the, the first one, why are we asking you to note this today and not approve it? When we brought the plan forward, we asked you to approve it, and you did approve it. Now we're setting out performance against that 
um, plan and we're asking you to note um, the, the performance. <clears throat> in terms of quality, it's not just been about compliance. That's absolutely right. I think equality is about aspiration. It's about aspiration for all members of our community, regardless of um, the challenges um, that they face. And I think we need to um, be very clear about that. And I think that has to be the ethos um, around about equalities. And, and in terms of mainstreaming, it isn't just a, um, a matter for you know, a particular officer or particular groups. This is the, the, the business of everybody within the council. Uh, the officers providing services on a daily basis, managers, third tier, senior managers, myself as chief executive. So I think that's the, um, the kind of um, leadership that the Equalities Agenda um, requires. In terms of evidence, um, and we are, I think, greatly improving the volume of evidence um, we have. You can see some of that in the report, but I accept that, that there is um, more to be done. And I also accept that the, um, the criticality of EQ um, IA and um, to the budget and to other um, service changes. And I think, again, that's something we're getting better at, but there is more, um, there is more to be done. So today's report is about um, demonstrating progress. Um, there is more to be done. I was clear about that in my um, introduction. Um, I think with the useful input of Councillor Pottinger as the Equalities uh, Champion and leadership across the Council, we will make that progress. Councillor Pottinger. Yeah, th this, this report was finished on the 30th of April and put online. So this Council has never approved this report that's in front of us just now. We've, we've, we've approved the, the, the two-year monitoring uh, cycle or whatever, you know, but this actual report was only completed on the 30th of April. So it has to be approved sometime. Mm -hmm. yeah? And if, if it's only for noting today, that, a lot of that I can see was to do with time scales. You know, we, we had to get it in by the 30th of April to the uh, Equalities and, and, and Human Rights. And, and we've done that by having it online and having an email copy, you know, uh, 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 probably uh, sent to them. On the issues, uh, uh, where are we going wrong, if you want? Uh, I think if you just uh, went back to the Malone Council the Quality Impact Assessment Form for the budget, it was quite an overarching report, you know, for all the voluntary organisations grant funded. But there was nothing specific in the actual effects of some of these uh, uh, decisions taken by this council on to how the impact was, was, was affecting others. Uh, and, the, and we have to comply fully with equalities. Uh, and I can circulate a copy of this uh, equalities um, outcomes, uh, uh, equalities impact assessment to, to, to all members of the administration. Uh, and other uh, specific points, I'm glad to hear that the third tier level is going to take place because really we do need this kind of working group across the council so it's not all left on one person's desk B because a lot of what Leslie's done in the past is helping other officers know how to do a quality impact assessments properly yeah, and she's done a lot of that you know, and there's a lot more people that can do that now um, and when, uh, but uh, I, don't, I don't like to think that uh, any of them were getting rushed through or just done as a tick box ex exercise that the, because these are open for challenges as well if they're not evidence based you know, and I, you know, I can pull them in and say, where's your evidence for that? Where's your evidence to say that more, uh, uh, more people in this council need more training? Uh, and particularly when you start talking about uh, budgets, you know, that you're talking about political parties uh, putting forward budgets, you know, and they really have to have them. You can't have them assessed well in advance because the information's out and sometimes the budget is not prepared to the very last minute. But the thing, the consideration of uh, the after effects of it, I mean, it should just be practically the language of the council. We approve this budget subject to uh, uh, a valid quality impact assessment being done on it. This is the kind of language I'm talking about and uh, how we can move forward. The development work that's been done in Midlothian should be put into a plan that we should have so much development work to get done, know just how much we're doing to, for compliance work. And the overlap will always be there. You know, and people can talk about the overlap, whether it's, whether it's in human resources or if it's in uh, equalities, you know. But equalities is always at the core, and it will overlap into every service provision. I mentioned earlier about the library, you know. I'm not saying that the library is not accessible. I'm not saying the library is not well used. I'm not saying the library is not a good service. But when I asked earlier about the library, I was asking about how many people of the protected characteristics are actually using the library. And how does that compare, you know, uh, for benchmarking with others? Are we, are we, is there a protected characteristic that's maybe not coming to our libraries because they don't feel that they can use it or welcome to it? 
you know, we, we know about a lot of the project work that goes on in the libraries and, you know, and the educational work, in particular in IT, but we need to put a proper plan down together to say what we're doing and where we're going. Councillor Rosie. Uh, just to ask, um, you know, Councillor Pottinger makes uh, an issue here of the budget and the equality issues at the time. It, correct me if I'm wrong, but I can't remember equality issues being raised at the time of the budget uh, when it was going through this council. Yeah? He's, 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 he's correct, because I didn't have that equality impact assessment in my hand at the time, uh, and I didn't have it until well after the budget. But also, he's, he's, he's correct in that the, a lot of the budget's just, just, just changed at the last minute. And, and also expected the Labour budget to win. Yeah, but uh, uh, so there we probably so I would have thought you could have challenged it at that time, so or raised these issues, but they were never raised. It's the first time you've raised it on the budget. Well, well, well we've raised many issues on the, the alarm tax, for instance. You know, uh, we've, we've raised many issues on on the taxi card license, and we've raised many issues on, on various parts there. Right, but uh, it was never raised as a comprehensive equality say, uh, reason. Can we move on now? Okay, so we'll move on to item 13. Sorry, I've still not got the answer to the question. When is this report going to be approved? Um, th th this report is not being brought forward for approval. We asked you to approve the policy, and in line with other performance reports, we then asked you to note the performance against the policy, making a comment. So it will, it will not be brought forward for approval. It's simply for you to note. Okay, so item number 13, City Deal for Edinburgh City Region Progress Update, a report by Kenneth Laurie, Chief Executive. Thank you, um, Deputy Provost. Um, this report provides a further update on progress being made in the preparation of a bid for um, a city deal in the Edinburgh City Region and seeks approval for funding towards the second stage of the bidding process. Um, it follows on from previous reports on the 16th of December and the 24th of March, and it sets out recent activity in respect of the city deal, including the key elements of a letter sent on 1st of April to both the UK Government's Minister of State at the Department for Business, Innovation and Skills and to the Scottish Government's Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure, Investment and Cities. And that letter was signed by the leaders of the six councils making up uh, the city deal. And as you can see at paragraph 3.2, an initial response has been received from the Scottish Government Cabinet Secretary uh, and a formal response from the UK Government is still awaited for reasons which I think are probably understandable. Um, in addition to the formal letters to ministers, a draft prospectus document has been sent to the two governments or the officials from the two governments um, and confidential copies of that have been um, circulated. In order to meet a demanding timetable, preparations are underway to enable a start to be made on stage two of the bidding process. This is a substantial area of work due to be completed early in 2016, at which point the main formal detailed bid would be submitted to the two governments. The work programme requires a comprehensive collaborative approach across all six councils and specifically on matters of finance, governance, skills, innovation and stakeholder communication. And a key element of that work will be the identification of priority infrastructure and other projects across the region, and for these to be subject to economic modelling to assess those which most effectively uh, meet the outcomes of the city deal. At this stage, the cost of the stage two work can, properly, can only be properly identified through the required formal procurement um, process, and it is intended um, that the six constituent partner councils will pay a contribution based upon their proportion of the region's population. And that contrasts with stage one, where all councils paid an equal share. And on the basis of initial estimates, the provision required for the second stage bid and associated preparation costs are estimated at 60,000. So the recommendations in front of you today, they ask that you note the further progress towards submission of a city deal bid agree to the supplementary estimate of 60,000 as set out in section 4.1 and receive further reports on the progress with City Deal. Thank you, Kenneth. Councillor Bryant. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, this council is doing a lot of work on the City Deal with our other partners in the other councils. But I'd like, just like to highlight a few figures here, that's all. Um, top of page 168. 
we're talking about investment of £1 billion, which might then access another £3 billion, making a total of £4 billion for this area. It's a fantastic, amazing benefit we're going to get. For example, the very first city here was Manchester, and they had £1.6 billion, and over the 10 years they created 266,000 jobs. So I'm quite happy to accept the recommendations. I just want to point out one of the risks, though, at 4.2. Uh, devolution of taxation powers. The national debate on the tax regime of powers to be devolved to the Scottish Parliament might delay the city deal negotiations. I'm happy to accept the recommendations. Council happy to accept the recommendations? Okay, so, so now we go back to item number seven. Pass over to Kenneth Laurie to explain the process. <laughs> um, thank you, um, Deputy Provost. Um, the, 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 the way we propose um, determining this issue is um, by um, a cut of cards. That would be the normal um, process. The Council's monitoring officer um, at all times keeps a, a deck of cards in his desk just in case they might be, um, they might be needed. So um, I'll ask the monitoring officer to um, um, go and get the, 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 the cards. And I mean, from my point of view, unless the monitoring officer indicates otherwise, it's simply the, um, the relevant parties that need to remain behind, the monitoring officer and myself, and we can resolve the issue. Uh, Councillor Young. Our ace is high. Yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> also, we would, we would agree that... With those that are partaking in the, in the draw. I wonder also if, um, in the interests of neutrality, uh, one of our religious representatives, perhaps our only, <laughs> our only remaining religious representative, would agree to shuffle the pack. <laughs> are, the, are, the suits ranked, are the suits ranked in spades, hearts, diamonds, clubs? For the, in the event of two sevens coming out. You follow the we, we, will, we will agree the precise terms of the draw with the, the, the parties taking part.